From time to time, people ask the question, how important is it to understand Bible prophecy? Do I have to understand Bible prophecy in order to be saved? Well, there's a scripture in the Bible that helps us to answer this. It's found in 2 Peter. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, which you do well that you take heed, like a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. In other words, it says that we should heed or listen to Bible prophecy, because it helps us to believe and to understand what is going on in our world today. That's the main purpose of Bible prophecy, to help you and I understand and have faith. It helps us see. But some people say, well, it just depends on how you interpret it. One person interprets it one way, someone else interprets it another way. But that's not what the scripture says, because this very next verse in Second Peter has this to say. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. We have to open the Word of God for ourselves, and we have to study it. We have to let Scripture interpret itself. It's not of private interpretation. It tells us that it didn't come about by man. For prophecy did not come in old times by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So the Bible tells us it has been directed by God. We cannot just take the text we like and come to our own conclusions. We have to take the Bible as a whole and compare Scripture with Scripture. The Bible often talks about having two or more witnesses before a judgment is taken, and it's the same when studying prophecy in the Bible. Second Corinthians tells us, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word will be established. You see, when we study God's word, we must read the scriptures as a whole, as it says in Isaiah. Precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All scripture, it doesn't just say the New Testament or just the Old. In other words, we have to take the whole Bible and see exactly what it says so that we can know and understand what God's word is teaching. In this study, we are going to take a look at the seventh chapter of Daniel, where Daniel has had a vision. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream, telling the main facts. So here it says that Daniel has this vision and he's written down what he saw. Daniel spoke and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, different from one another. So Daniel in his vision sees the wind blown out across the water, and as a result of it, four beasts come up from the sea. The first was like a lion, and had eagle's wings. I beheld, till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth, and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear, it was raised up on one side, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I studied the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, 
In this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. So Daniel saw the wind blowing on the water, and four beasts rose up, a lion, a bear, a leopard, and a dragon. Now we're going to take a look as God helps us understand exactly what each one of these beasts mean. You see, in prophecy it uses symbols, and these symbols apply all the way through, and you will begin to understand them. Now Daniel saw the wind blowing on the water. In Bible prophecy, you will find that water has a very definite meaning. Daniel spoke and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Now when you're working with Bible prophecy, and don't apply it outside of Bible prophecy, water represents people. We will look at Revelation for this. And he said to me, The waters which you saw, where the horse is, are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. So when he sees the wind blowing on the water, that water represented people, nations and languages. Wind also has a very definite meaning in Revelation and we'll go there now to find out the interpretation of this. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. So we see that in Bible prophecy, wind represents war or strife. They would harm the sea. So Daniel was seeing war and strife among the people. And it says, And four great beasts came up from the sea, different from one another. Now God simply does something that we do. For instance, if you were to go home and you were to pick up the newspaper and turn over to the political cartoons, there you would see a lion, a bear, an eagle and a rooster, all sitting around the conference table. Who would the eagle represent? The United States. Who would the lion represent? England. Who does the bear represent? Russia. Who would the rooster represent? France. You see, God just uses those different beasts to represent nations, just like we do today. So he says that four beasts rose up, and he tells us who those beasts represent. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. So it tells us very clearly that the four beasts represent four different kings. Now let's look at them one at a time. The first was like a lion, and had eagle's wings. I watched until its wings were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth, and made to stand on its feet like a man, and the man's heart was given to it. This beast, this lion, represented the kingdom of Babylon. In fact, if you were to go to the British Museum where they did much of the excavation of Babylon, you will see statues of lions with eagle wings on the Ishtar Gate. God simply used this lion to represent Babylon, and it makes reference to this in Scripture. The lion has come out from his thicket, and the destroyer of the nations is on his way. He has gone out from his place to make your land desolate. Your cities will be laid waste without an inhabitant. Jeremiah is talking, and he's describing Babylon as it was going to come up on Israel. Nebuchadnezzar had built Babylon, and this is the only beast that you will find where it says a man's heart was given to it. And the reason is because of the conversion of Nebuchadnezzar in accepting and serving the God of heaven. So it says that a man's heart was given to this beast. So this lion represented ancient Babylon. But let's go on as he describes for us the next beast. And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear, it was raised up on one side, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said to it, Arise, devour much flesh. This bear represents the power that was going to overthrow Babylon, which was Medo-Persia. They overthrew Babylon under the leadership of Cyrus. It was a coalition of two powers, the Medes and the Persians, that came together to form one power. The scripture says that this bear raised itself up on one side. 
The Persians were stronger than the Medes, and that's the reason it raised itself up on one side. It has three ribs in its mouth, and those three ribs represented the three countries that Medo-Persia overthrew, which were Babylon, Egypt and Libya. Those were the three that she overthrew. And so it says that under the leadership of Cyrus they would overthrow Babylon. And that's exactly what happened in history. Taking his army they surrounded the city of Babylon. It was looked upon as a city that could not be taken. Historians tell us that they had enough food inside that city to last them for forty years without ever going outside. They went up on the wall and threw food to Cyrus and laughed at him. Cyrus took his men and they marched down the Euphrates River because the Euphrates River ran right through the middle of Babylon. And there at a selected spot they began to dig canals. Then they find out that the king of Babylon, Belshazzar, was going to have a party and they broke those canals and diverted the river Euphrates. And Cyrus and his men walked up the muddy bottom of the Euphrates River the gates were open as scripture had predicted, and he and his men marched in and overthrew the city of Babylon. Then it says there's a third beast, like a leopard. After this I looked, and there was another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. Now this third beast represented the power of Greece. Greece overthrew Medo-Persia, Alexander the Great faced Darius and the Medes and Persians on the plains of Arbella. Darius had one million men, Alexander the Great had only 40,000. But Alexander the Great overthrew Darius in 331 BC because he had devised a new kind of warfare. Alexander the Great took his army and they begin to march and move for seven years without ever going home until they reached the very borders of the country of India and then his men refused to go any further. So they head back home to Babylon. Alexander the Great is now suffering. He is suffering from epilepsy, from malaria and from drunkenness. And as he lies in his bed dying, his four generals are called in and they asked him, to whom will you give your kingdom? And he said, I'll give my kingdom to the strongest. And when he died, Alexander the Great's kingdom was divided among his four generals. That's why the leopard beast has four heads, because it represented Alexander the Great's four generals, and that's how the kingdoms became divided. The wings on the back of the beast represented the swiftness which Alexander the Great took everything that was before him. But now we come to the fourth beast. The fourth beast is the power of pagan Rome. Pagan Rome overthrew Greece in 168 BC. The scripture presents it as a dragon. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold a fourth beast dreadful and terrible and exceeding strong. It had great iron teeth, it devoured and brake in pieces and stamped the residue with its feet, and it was different from all the beasts that came before it, and it had ten horns. Rome is to rule longer than any other power, from 168 BC to 476 AD. Rome did certain things that none of the other kingdoms did, it was through the inventions of Rome that civilization was brought to the world because Rome was the one that made the roads safe. She made the waterways safe and she had soldiers march down the road carrying banners that said Pax Romana, which meant Roman peace and people were able to travel where they had never been able to travel before. That's why you see Jesus Christ appearing on the scene of action at this time. You remember it was a decree of Caesar Augustus that sent Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem to pay their taxes. Why did they show up at this time in history? Because the opportunity was now presented for the first time in history for the gospel to be spread across the whole world. The waterways and the roads were now safe. You remember it's this same power that's ruling at the time Jesus died because he was tried in a Roman court and it was a Roman soldier that struck the spear in his side. But the scripture says that this fourth beast had ten horns. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and exceeding strong, and it had great iron teeth, 
It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped the residue with its feet, and it was different from all the beasts that came before it, and it had ten horns. Now one of the great phenomena of history takes place. When great masses of people all move at one time, they were known as the Goths. They were Germanic people. They came down and overran the Roman Empire, breaking it into pieces. These Goths, Germanic people, became the nations of Western Europe today. Such people as the Alemanni, the Franks, the Lombards, the Anglo-Saxons, the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, the Huruli. These were the tribes that came down and they broke the kingdom in pieces and they became the nations of Western Europe. The Alemanni became the Germans, the Anglo-Saxons, the English, the Franks became the French, etc. That's where those nations all come from. But it goes on and it says... I studied the horns, those ten horns, and behold, there came up among them. So as he was looking at these ten horns, all of a sudden a little horn is coming up among those ten horns. Another little horn, before whom three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. So it says this little horn was going to uproot three of those horns. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. Now the last time we looked at Daniel the second chapter, we traced down Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece and Rome. In this study the scripture takes us a step farther now, because we now have a little horn coming up. You see, this is the way scripture works. The Bible reaches out in one place, and it will take a subject so far and it will stop. And then in another chapter it will reach right back and start again. And this time it will take it a little farther. And then the next time you read God's word it will take it farther again. And it takes it step by step. So today we are going to look at this little horn and find out who it's talking about. Because it gives us about six points to identify that little horn. Now listen carefully because God is going to give you points to identify them. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. So it says that those ten horns had to come up out of the Roman Empire. They would rise out of that kingdom. After them another king will arise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. So it says there's going to come another horn and it's going to come up after them. It's going to subdue three kings. And he will speak great words against the Most High, and will persecute the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And the saints will be given into his hand for a time, times and half a time. So the scripture says this little horn is going to come up, and he's going to do definite things. Let's look at those six points. It says it will come up among the ten. You can't look for it over in Africa. You can't look for it over in the United States or in Asia. It had to come up among those ten, which is Europe, Western Europe, because that's what those ten horns were. Remember in our statue we had ten toes. Now we have ten horns. So it tells us where it has to arise. Secondly, it says, it would arise after the ten horns. Those ten horns came into existence in 476 AD. Therefore this little horn has to come up on the scene of action after 476 AD. Thirdly it says, it will be different from the first ten horns. So this little horn that's going to come up is not going to be like those first ten. It's going to be different than they were. For it says it would uproot three of the first ten horns. It would uproot three of them. It says it will be a persecuting power. And six, it said, it would rule for a time, times and half a time. Now we must look at these six points and establish what it's talking about. It says at the beginning,
I studied the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. It said that this little horn was going to come up among them, among the ten horns. It establishes very clearly what you and I need to look for, because it had to come up among those ten horns. It says that this horn would come up after them. As we have seen, these ten horns overthrew the Roman Empire in 476 AD. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. After them another king will arise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. The Roman Empire is ruled by Justinian. Justinian sees his empire falling apart. These Goths are running over him, so he's trying to save his empire. History tells us exactly what took place. Listen to this statement, because it will tell you what happened. The Roman Church in this way proudly pushed itself into the place of the Roman world empire, of which it is the actual continuation. The empire is not perished, but has only undergone a transformation. It is a political creation, and as imposing as a world empire. Because of the continuation of the Roman Empire, the Pope, who calls himself King, and Pontifex Maximus, is Caesar's successor. So what history said is, all of a sudden, the Roman Church found itself in a position where it was no longer just a church, but it would receive state power. How did this happen? How did this take place? Well, it took place this way. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. After them another king will arise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. This little horn is going to be different from the other six, from the first ones, and he will subdue three kings. These ten Germanic tribes were strictly political powers, that's all they were. But all of a sudden, the scripture says there is arising a little horn that's going to be different than the other ones. You see, Justinian and his general Balsirius have been fighting these Goths, trying to drive them back down to the city of Rome. Now there's a bishop in Rome. He's a good man and he loves the Lord. His name is Salvarius. He loves the Lord and he has refused to be involved in the battle. Every time the Goths have gotten close, he has closed all the gates to the city of Rome and refused to let them in. Actually, when Justinian's army has gotten close, he has closed the gates to the city of Rome and refused to let them in. He has been impartial, not wanting to be involved in the war. But Justinian and his general Balsirius have considered that Bishop Salvarius is more in favour of the Goths than he is of Justinian. The Goths have backed Justinian's army right up to the walls of the city of Rome, and it looks like they're going to perish. Justinian sends a note to his wife, Theodora, to save his army. Now it just so happens that Justinian's wife is a Christian and she's also a friend of the bishop. Justinian pleads with her to do something so she pleads with the bishop to open up the gates and let Justinian's army in and save them, which she did. Justinian and Belzerius, however, had already agreed that if they got inside the city they would execute the bishop and they did just that. Why? Because Justinian sees that if he can control the people not just from the point of politics, but from the point of religion, he can completely... The Bishop of Rome in the seat of Caesar was now the greatest man in the West and was soon forced to become the political as well as the spiritual head. To the Western world, Rome was still the political capital, hence the whole habit of mind, all ambition, pride and sense of glory and every social prejudice favoured the evolution of the great city into the ecclesiastical capital. Civil as well as religious disputes were referred to the successor of Peter for settlement. I studied the horns, and behold there came up among them another little horn, before whom three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. It says that this power would uproot three of those horns. You see, these Germanic people came down and they settled in the Roman Empire. They were barbarians. 
But Christ had given a commission to the Christians that they were to preach the gospel in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and all the world. And so the Christians saw an opportunity of taking the gospel to these Germanic people and to their surprise they found them opening their hearts, readily accepting the gospel. And that's why Western Europe is basically Christian today. But among the people that went in preaching about Christ to these Germanic people, there were some that taught a belief called Arianism. Now Arianism is the belief that Jesus Christ was a good man, that he was a prophet, but that he was not divine. The Bishop of Rome and Justinian opposed this belief very much. Three of these Germanic tribes accepted that belief, and these are the three you see destroyed. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. After them another king will arise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. Those three kings were the Heruli, the Vandals and the Ostrogoths. Justinian sent out his armies and they wiped them off the map. Scripture says they would be uprooted. Now if you were to go down to the library and look up the Anglo-Saxons, you would find they are the ancestors of the English. If you look up the Alamanni, you'll find they are the ancestors of the Germans. If you look up the Franks, you'll find they are the ancestors of the French, etc. But if you look up these three, the Vandals, the Ostrogoths and the Heruli, you'll find they have no descendants. Scripture said the little horn power would uproot them, pull them out by the roots, and that's exactly what happened. There are no descendants of these people. Exactly as the scripture said, it took place. And he will speak great words against the Most High, and will persecute the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and the saints will be given into his hand for a time, times and half a time. It said this power would persecute the saints of the Most High. Now any time in history that you care to talk about, when a church, no matter what church, when it has moved in and has gained state control, any time that has happened, you have always had persecution. This has never failed. And when the church here received state power, you find in history that a great persecution begins to take place. For instance, all you have to do is read about the massacre of St. Bartholomew, where they slew 60,000 Huguenots in one Sunday morning. Read about the Spanish Inquisition, the Inquisition of the Dutch. All you have to do is read such books as Fox's Book of Martyrs, Short's Short Stories of the Reformation, the History of the Reformation by Daubigny, and Here I Stand by Bateman. All those will outline very clearly to you how these people suffered under a state that was ruled by a church. This has happened over and over in history. But let's go on speaking about this little horn. So this power was going to rule for a definite period of time. Now you find in the Bible it gives a rule to count time by. For instance, in the Bible, a time, one year. A half a time represents half a year. So if I have time, times and a half of times, I've got three and a half years. Also, God gives a rule in the Bible that when you are counting time in prophecy and don't apply this out of prophecy, but a day represents one year. That's what it tells us in Ezekiel 4 to 6 and also in Numbers 14 to 34. I have appointed you a day for a year. Now, if I've got three and a half years and in biblical reckoning of time, there happens to be 360 days in a year. So if I have Three and a half years, all I have to do is multiply three and a half years times 360 and it gives me 1260 days and each day represents a year. Now when Justinian sent his general Belzerius into the city of Rome and they executed the bishop, that date was 538 AD. History says that the bishop of Rome stepped to the seat of Caesar and seized the scepter. Now, if I come 
1260 years from 538 AD, it takes me to 1798 AD. Something had to happen in 1798, something had to take place, and that's as far as I'm going to take you today. In our next study, we're going to find out what happened in 1798, but it identifies this little horn for you. We don't have to have any dates who the little horn is. You see, the scripture's just adding, it's just adding each time. We've talked about all of these things. We've talked about the head of gold, the lion, and that's Babylon. God is just picking that up and lining it up for us. We've talked about the arms and the chest of silver, and that's the bear, Medo-Persia. We talked about that. The belly and thighs of brass or bronze, which was the leopard, and that was Greece. We talked about this one as well. The legs of iron and the dragon, and that was pagan Rome. You remember that pagan Rome was divided into ten. Remember the image had ten toes. The dragon had ten horns. You see the consistency of scripture. Among those ten horns was a little horn that came up, which was Papal Rome. Papal Rome came into existence in 538 AD. Now what becomes extremely important about this is because of what it says next. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. It's talking about his papal power. Listen carefully. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Now it is said that that power would rule for a time, times and a half of time, or dividing of time, which we trace down to the date of 1798. And it says that the court is seated. The court is seated, and it says that the kingdom is going to be given to God's people. We are just going step by step down through time. In our next study, we will be looking at the beast, the dragon and the woman. And I hope you'll join us in the next part of this intriguing journey.